Got it. And yeah, we'll begin. Dear Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Yeah, we thank you for the rain weekend about to start. And I just pray that you just be with us today. Help us to again, Lord, glorify you in what we do, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. It was. So, tensor products. Um, first of all, um, I will warn you, I have deliberately not told you to read sections 27 and 28 in Curtis because, whoa, I mean, they're, yeah, they're deep. And uh, it's more than we need. And um, so what I'm trying to do here is just give you some of the more elementary um, ways of looking at it and thinking about it. And also to touch base with some things I've done earlier in various homeworks in terms of something called the Kronecker product. So that's hopefully where, where we'll get to today. Um, let me start with something that's a little bit different, though. Um, so if you have, like, it's just a basically an example. Um, if I have B, and it's a, um, a bilinear transformation, say some, say from, um, you know, V cross V. Now let's say V dual. No, 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 no. I'll make up my mind eventually here. V cross V to, um, to the reals. And suppose that this is bilinear. All right. Then we have the following calculation. If, if um, let's say gamma, now let's say beta. Let's say beta equals to um, V1, V2, da, 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 Vn basis for V. then um, you can write x as the sum of you know, x upper i, v lower i, and you can write y as the sum of y upper j, v lower j, as we've been doing. And then we can calculate b of x comma y is equal to, all right, what's it equal to? It's equal to b of the sum, right, of xi vi, comma, the sum of yj lower v lower vj like this. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> linear. Um, yeah, bilinear. There we go. Hey. Um, OK, so if it's linear in each slot, that means we can pull out the sums, both of them. And um, this gives us a sum over i and j of x upper i, um, y upper j, b of vi comma vj, right? And um, And so I can rewrite this, right? I can rewrite this actually as the following. I can rewrite this as the sum of i and j, b of v i, v j. And then what I do is I write um, v upper i tensor, v upper j, parentheses, um, x comma y. And let me, let me elaborate on what I'm saying here. So I'm defining a new thing. I'm saying that you can take, you can take uh, we can define if um, alpha and beta are in the dual, v dual, then alpha tensor beta defines a new mapping. And the way it works is that alpha tensor beta, alpha tensor beta, when it acts on a pair, say x comma y, the way that works, all right, is simply this. It does alpha of x times beta of y. So I'm just, at the moment, I'm just using this circle with an x through it as a notation for this, this specific construction. A way we can take two 
two dual vectors and make some new, new contraption here, so-called alpha tensor beta, defined by that rule. Now, you're like, well, wait a minute, how does that, what does that have to do with this? Well, just to, just to unwrap it, let me explain in more, in more, depth, in more depth here. See, we have xi, yj. Remember, we have from previous lectures proved that that's the dual basis vi acting on x times the dual basis vj acting on y, all right? Now here, vi, v upper i and v upper j, and v upper j, they're both in, in, in v dual. And so my definition right there applies, all right? And in particular, this is exactly vi tensor vj acting on x comma y. And then I'm using the usual, we can add maps together pointwise by their rule um, in order to factor out the evaluation at x comma y here. What this calculation shows us is that with this new thing called the tensor, we can, we can build these new mappings, vi tensor vj, which can be used as sort of fundamental building blocks for bilinear maps. I can build a bilinear map B from a linear combination of these guys. Goodness gracious, I hope these are bilinear. Is, is alpha tensor beta, beta, <laughs> beta, listen to me. Is alpha tensor, uh, alpha tensor beta, um, I mean if I'd watched Cars this recently I'd have an excuse. I could just say I had Mater on the mind, but that's not it. No, is, is, I mean alpha tensor beta, alpha beta, oh, in my, <laughs> <laughs> alpha tensor beta, Gosh, it's getting worse. <sighs> this <laughs> is a bilinear map. Well, that's not quite accurate either. Oh, no, that is accurate. It's bilinear. If you replace x with a linear combination, you get a linear combination over here, right? If you replace y with a linear combination, you get a linear combination over here. But linearity of alpha and beta, respectively, allow you to split it up. I mean, you can prove that alpha tensor beta is in fact a bilinear map. So this is sort of a concrete use of the tensor product. When people talk about tensor products, they're really talking about two different things. The one thing is this sort of world where we can concretely build um, multilinear maps using tensor product of vectors and dual vectors like this. And then the other place where people talk about tensor products is actually at the level of spaces, like taking the tensor product of two vector spaces. And that's what I'm, I'm probably going to talk most about today. But I just I wanted to go through this a little bit just to give you this language. Um, so more generically, what's a tensor product? I mean, <clears throat> the abstract notion of a tensor product. I mean, this is, uh, basically it's this. Um, you're given, say, vector spaces, and this is still limited. I mean, the, the notion of tensor product is more general than that even. But certainly given, tensor, given vector spaces, over f, all right, say v1, v2, as many as you like, let's take k of them, we can construct, we won't, don't worry, but we could construct v1 tensor v2 tensor da 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 tensor vk. This is a new vector space formed in some sense from multiplying the vectors. That's not quite accurate, but taking the tensor product of the vectors of v1 through vk. <coughs> um, so a typical element in here would be something like, an example of an element would be something like um, x1 tensor x2 tensor da 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 tensor xk, and then you could do something like plus um, some other one, you know? Where x, 
um, sub i and y sub i are elements of the i for i equals to 1, 2, k. Anyway, this is something we can do with vector spaces. We can take the tensor product of vector spaces. We get a new space called the tensor product. And you notice what I didn't write was, I didn't write parentheses, right? So by construction, the tensor product is an associative product. Like, I don't need, I don't need to tell you whether I'm taking the tensor of x1 and x2 and then x3 or, or vice versa. It's, it's an associative product. So that, that sort of basically what it is. And it, other than that, it kind of just behaves like normal. And I'll just do it for two because it's getting really old writing so many of them. But um, let's just look at for two of them. You have things like this. If I have v plus w tensor u, I'll have things like v tensor u plus w tensor u. And if I have something like v tensor, say, cu plus um, w, guess what? I've got c v tensor u plus v tensor w. What I'm telling you is the laws of distribution and pulling out scalars work as usual. So it's, it's, a, you know, it's a somewhat familiar structure. Now, obviously, this begs a giant question, which is like, well, what do you mean you can just take the tensor product of vector spaces? What is that? How do you actually do that? All right? And the question of existence is a harder question. How, do, how does, such, a, how, how does such, a, such an object exist? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow um, Burbian, and I'm going to give you a somewhat explicit construction of v tensor w. Uh, a, a concrete construction, if you will. Um, so we'll, we'll do that now. So here, concrete. Concrete tensor products. So what, what I'm really doing is I'm showing you a model of a, I'm showing you a linear algebraic system which has this structure. All right, so you could, you, it's, it's, it's an example of a tensor product. Um, here, here it is. So V tensor W is, you can just take it to be the linear transformations from V dual to W. Now here, V and W finite dimensional, finite dimensional over F. All right. So basically, here's the deal. We can define, in this context, the, the tensor of elements as follows, like x tensor y. That's going to be what? Allegedly, the tensor product here is what? It's linear transformations from v dual to w. And here, I'm saying x is an element of v. And, and, and y is an element of w, OK? So how would we define this in terms of our, our specific structure here? What should we feed it to make sense of it? Its domain is what? v dual, right? So my, my typical notation there would be something like alpha, all right? Alpha being v dual. So alpha being in v dual means alpha is itself what? Alpha is a mapping, a linear transformation from v to the field, right? So it's simply defined to be this. What you do is you do alpha of x times y. Does that make sense? Well, alpha of x is a, something in the field, right? It's a number. And y, well, y is something in w. So yeah, that makes sense, at least. It is going, its output is in w, all right? More than this, we can also notice that the assignment, if you look at x comma y, maps to x tensor y. Um, this is bilinear. 
This is a bilinear map. If I was to give this a name, say psi, you can see that psi is a mapping from, um, well, v cross w um, to the tensor w. And this is a bilinear map. Now that's bilinear. Maybe that's a slightly more general notion of bilinear than I've. I, I've been talking about bilinear from like v, v, v or v dual. I mean, do you understand bilinear can be made sense of for when the vector spaces aren't the same, right? I mean, there's nothing written in stone that these have to be the same. You can talk about bilinear on v cross w if you want. I really have no choice here. I try not to until I have to. So there it is. All right. Um, anyway, that's a bilinear map because it's linear in x and in y, right? The linearity in x is clear here because alpha is linear, right? So if I have x1 plus x2, I could break this up, alpha of x1 plus alpha of x2, and then I can, I can break it up. And I also have manifest linearity in y because of the way, the way the y appears in the formula. You can, you can prove that psi is a bilinear map, right? OK. Um, more than this, though, I can make a simple claim here. If you, if, um, if beta, let's say beta is v1, vn, and gamma is w1 through wm, our bases um, for v and w respective, then what? Then if you look at the following, vi tensor wj, um, you know, i equals to 1 to da da da, da and j equals to 1 to da da da, da m. Well, this is a basis for v tensor w. Um, how do you prove that? Well, one step at a time, I suppose. Um, let's see here. Another day, another noise. Let's see here. Um, I guess I should take, I should try to show you something. Let's see, what does this, what's this look like? I need a, le a letter, any letter. How about S? S, an element of L of V dual W means what? S is a mapping from what? From V dual to W, right? So, I can look at S of um, S of alpha, right? I mean, I can do that, and um, I can I can also look at that as S of what? That's really S of the sum alpha lower i, v upper i, like that. And I'm getting nowhere fast. I think I'm going about this the wrong way. So this is, a, is an element of W, right? So of course we can, um, 
we can also write this as a sum j equals 1 to m of this thing, whatever it is. Let me go back to S of alpha for just a second here. So it's this j, well, excuse me, I'm using upper indices for j, of, um, that's using the base, the fact that w's form a basis, uh, the w sub 1, 2, 3 to the m form a basis for w, right? Um, now, we, we know that this S alpha upper J is equal to what? That's equal to V, well, excuse me, equal to W upper J, right, of S alpha. We also know that. Well, we don't we don't have any inner products here though, so. No, I don't think we have that here. I think I just have made a uh, a poor notational choice. Yeah. Um, let's see here. So I can, I mean, I just need to keep going here. So this. Um, is itself the sum over i equals 1 to m of um, alpha, uh, let's see here, lower i, um, and then wj, upper j, of um, the upper i. I have somehow worked myself into a corner. I'm trying to show that this S can be written as a sum of those guys, all right? Um, I think what I should do here for a second, just for inspiration, is to look at what if we ha have, a s have a sum, say Cij, all right, of Vi tensor Wj. What is that? What is, how does that? How does that behave? If you let this act on um, alpha, what do you get? Sum over i and j over the appropriate ranges. I goes from one to n. J goes from one to m. Cij, and what we have here is alpha of vi wj. So oh yeah, that's it. So this, sorry, I just had a moment of, uh, so you got some i over j. And this reduces to alpha i w upper j of v, um, vi. Um, WJ, but this is. Oh no! Stick up just a second. So by definition, the alpha acts on that thing. Um, I can't take W upper J of VI. That doesn't make sense. Where'd my S go? That's a question here. I, I, I've somehow lost the S, right? That, that, that's what, there's a mistake here. So I, this, this alpha, right? is the sum of alpha lower i v upper i. So that sum pulls out the alpha i, and 
there's, but there's still S act, it's S acting on VI is the, is the thing. So I should get alpha I, um, WJ is, so we have WJ on this. So I have alpha I, WJ, S of V upper I. Yeah, the S is still there though. Right. So I have alpha I, W upper J, of S of V upper I, and then WJ over here. Okay, so what this is, is this is a, um, this is a vector in W, right? And um, and of course, VI is a dual vector in V, right? Ah, I am sorry. I'm thoroughly confused. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna scrap this. Oh, that up there was fine. Ah. It's the part I haven't written down, <laughs> of course. Let's try this again. I'm going to move on since apparently I will not be able to finish this without you guys talking. You guys talking is the death of me thinking, so we're moving on. All right, so this is in fact a basis. It is true. And once you do that, what do you have? You have the dimension. And you can actually see this from other arguments anyway. But the dimension of V tensor W is in fact equal to what then? If this is a basis, and if I wrote it out more concretely, you can order it this way. So like V1 tensor W1, Vn tensor W1, or V1 tensor Wm, and then you do like V2 tensor W1 all the way out to V2 tensor Wm. This is what I'm doing right now is called the lexicographic ordering. So it's like dictionary ordering, right? You do the, the sort of like the first letter is the V and the second letter is the W. And so like you do one, 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 one for V and then you go two. Eventually you get to N for V. And then you finally end, the last thing in the basis would be like Vn tensor Wm. So if you count this, of course you can count how many there are there. There are m times n. So in fact, this is the dimension of V times the dimension of W. Sorry, I <laughs> seem to be unable to prove that's the basis for you at the moment. It's not that complicated. I'm just getting lost in stupid notation. This is actually very easy to see. Can you guys tell me why this is true? Just think about how I've defined it concretely here. If you look at this, it's pretty obvious why that's the dimension, why that dimension is true, right? This, right? Linear transformations from V dual to W, what is that? So if you think about that, you can represent this by what? This is n dimensional, this is m dimensional. Linear transformations from an n dimensional space to an m dimensional space is just n times m dimensional. We, we, we've proved this before. So of course this is true. But the reason it's true, in fact, is that these things form a basis for V tensor W. Uh, man, you would not believe the amount of time I spent trying to be able to be ready to show that to you guys. Oh well. All right, I'm going to move along then. Once you have that, you can define other things such as, and now we are, um, so this, um, oh, 
goodness gracious. What are the properties of this concrete tensor product? It has these sorts of properties. Like you can prove, in fact, that, um, you know, like x plus, um, let's say, v1 plus v2 tensor w is v1 tensor w plus v2 tensor w. And likewise, um, if you have v tensor w1 plus w2, you have v tensor w1 plus v tensor w2. Um, ahem. I'll prove one of these for you. I think I'll actually be successful in that. Let me go here. Ooh, look at this green marker. Maybe this will make me take better. Let's see here. So to prove one of these identities, what you got to do is look at, say, v1 plus v2, tensor w. Now, this is just notation for a mapping from v dual to w at the moment. So I can let this act on alpha, right? And that is, by definition, alpha on v1 plus v2 times w. Again, going back to the basic definition of the tensor product of elements. And um, so then, this is equal to alpha of v1, w, plus alpha of v2, w, which, by the way, we can rewrite as v1 <coughs> tensor w acting on alpha plus v2 tensor w acting on alpha. And then you can pull the alpha out. There's no pluses. These are all supposed to be, my, 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 t my x got sideways. If we were to write plus with the circle, that would be something different. And there you have it. This is true for arbitrary alpha. Consequently, we get this identity right up here. I think one of the homework problems that I'm going to give you is to prove this one. Is that too awful? It shouldn't be. I mean, if I show you this, it shouldn't be too bad. You can do the same thing for this. And you can also pull scalars out. So what I'm trying to say here is that this thing I've boxed in purple is a specific model of something that has this more general structure that it's it has these linearity properties, and if you were to, if you were to repeat this, you'd get associativity. Um, but there's something else that people always think about with the tensor product, and it's there's a certain connection between linearity and bilinearity. Um, but I have a suspicion that I'm well. I think fine. All right, where was I? So here's the theorem, if I can find that. Um, if you have u, v, and w vector spaces over f, and beta is a mapping from v cross w to u um, bilinear, is bilinear, right? Then there exists a unique T sub beta, which is a mapping from v tensor w to u linear, which is a linear map. And T beta of x tensor y is simply beta of x, y.
Okay, so um, here's the proof. If z is a sum, cij, vi tensor wj, so that's a typical element of z tensor w. You can let T beta of Z, we can define T beta of Z, all right, to be equal to, what we do is we just use the coefficients, these Cij's to define this mapping. So sum of Ryan J of Cij beta, all right, of Vi Wj. Um, so if this is, uh, well, okay, so uniqueness will fall, if, if we can show that this is a linear map, this is definitely, uni it's definitely unique, right? I mean, the construction is unique, it's just based on these coefficients. These coefficients are uniquely given for each z, so this is a formula which has implicit within it the notion of uniqueness. So we have that. But the question remains, is it linear, right? How would you show that this mapping is linear? Well, for that, if we had a, let's say, suppose we had a Z2, which was equal to the sum of, let's say, Bij. Well, maybe B is a bad letter. What do you guys want? Um, I don't know. I haven't used D for anything for a while. How about Dij? Um, Vi tensor Wj. And let's let um, C seems like a bad choice. Um, I mean, I need another letter. I haven't used Pac-Man in a while. Pac-Man is an element of the field, all right? Then if you look at T beta, uh, Pac-Man times Z plus Z2, what do you get? So what is the sum of these things in the tensor product? What you're doing is you're just going to add the coefficients to each other. That's how they add. So the coefficients of this sum will be, um, I mean, it's going to be T beta of the sum I and J of um, Pac-Man times the Cij plus the Dij, all of that Vi tensor Wj. So that is exactly the sum over I and J of Pac-Man times Cij plus Dij times parentheses um, beta acting on Vi Wj. So here I just use the definition of T beta, right? But the thing is, you can rewrite that sum as a combination of two sums. This is nothing more than Pac-Man sum over Cij beta of vi wj plus the sum over dij of beta vi wj, which by the way is nothing more than Pac-Man t beta of z plus t beta of z1. So that shows you that, in fact, T beta is linear, right? We can pull constants out. We have additivity. Yes, sir? There's no, there's no Z. It's just, it's just Z. I didn't put a one on it. Oh, that's a Z2. Yes, thank you. Very good. Very good, very good. Yes, yes, yes. That is, the, that is true. Um,
what remains, all that remains now, guys, is to check this condition right here, right? So one of the things I often get stuck on is when I think about vTensor beta, uh, vTensor W, I sometimes get it in my mind that everything in vTensor W looks like that. But that's not the case. Like in vTensor W, there are also things that are sums of tensor products, right? Not every tensor product can be written just like that. If it, if it can, it's, it's a very special kind of tensor product. If it can be written just as the product of just a single you know, tuple of vectors. Um, anyway, so this x tensor y is just nothing more than, um, you know, this is the sum over ij of x upper i, y upper j, um, vi tensor wj. So basically, these are the cijs that I was talking about down here. And if you put, if you put here, so you've got like, you know, t beta of x tensor y, well, that would be equal to the sum ij of x upper i, y upper j, um, beta of v i v j. But guess what? When you pull the sums inside, you get beta of x y, which is what we wanted. That calculation I have done more carefully and slowly for the metric last time. It's the same calculation, though, basically. All right, well, I mean, let me get to the punchline here. It turns out that this theorem becomes the definition for more general tensor products. So like basically a tensor product is something that it's some kind of product of the two spaces such that if you're given a bilinear mapping from the Cartesian product of the two spaces into this thing you're calling a tensor product, if it, if it has the property that every bilinear mapping induces a unique linear mapping, then it's said to be a tensor product. So this theorem becomes the definition. Um, which isn't something I want to test you on because I don't have enough time to properly exposit that. But um, this here, a little bit easier to understand. And once you have that, you can talk more about more general tensor spaces. Like for example, definition. If you have linear transformations, if you have like T, which is a linear transformation on V, and if you have W, which is a linear transformation, um, oops, <laughs> bad, bad, bad choice of letters. Um, S is a linear transformation on W. Right? Then you can define T tensor S, a new linear transformation. Guess where it goes from? It's a linear transformation on V tensor W. In particular, you define it as follows. T tensor S acting on X tensor Y, guess what it is? It's so simple. It Indeed, Jess is the winner. Um, oops, S of Y. Just like that. And there are simple and wonderful theorems for these. For example, um, well, by the way, this tensor product of operators, it also has these same bilinearities for the tensor. I don't want to write them down, but like this sum, it's still, you know, this, this tensor product works algebraically the same. Also, composition is pretty neat. If I have T1 tensor S1, and I compose with T2 tensor S2, this is composition, then that's in fact equal to T1 T2 tensor S1 S2. So the product of the composites and the tensor product works together nicely like that. There's something really neat, nice, that's nice that happens from this. Basically, once you have that property, it's not hard to prove that if you have T and S invertible, then the inverse of this is what? You guys probably by now are programmed to tell me it's S inverse tensor T inverse, right? But this one applies not sock shoes, but sock socks. So it's actually T inverse tensor S inverse is actually the, the case here. One of the other things that's true about this is if you have the identity on V, tensor the identity on W, in fact, it's equal to the identity on V tensor W. Oops, no circle here. Sorry, Star Wars on the brain. Um, 
This is also true. There's a, a long list of these wonderful, wonderful properties for the tensor product of maps. Um, these are the central ones. The, the proof of this is actually pretty fun. All you have to do is, I mean, the one direction is pretty simple. If you know that T inverse and S inverse exist, then to prove that that's the inverse follows immediately from this rule up here pretty much. The other direction, you have to show that the, if the kernel of this is zero, it implies that the kernel of T and the kernel of S are both separately zero, which is also a nice little argument. Um. <coughs> All right, finally, so let me, I have used at various points in the homework the tensor product of matrices, right? What do we, how, how do we define the tensor product of matrices? Do you guys remember? I called it the Kronecker product. How was this defined? Yeah? So it's like the top, the top block was A11B, A12B, right? A, if we're doing, let's say, 1n, b, a, n, n. These are square, so it looks like this. The so-called Kronecker product. Now, so here's the, here's the, here's the theorem. The matrix of T tensor S, all right, in let's say the beta tensor gamma basis. And by that I mean this one I was writing over here. This I would say is the beta, this is the beta tensor gamma, and that's an abusive language, but this is basically the tensor product of the beta basis and the gamma basis in lexicographic ordering. That is a basis, in fact, um, Oh man, yeah, yeah. That's a basis for. Um, I mean, T tensor S does what? T tensor S is a mapping from V tensor W to V tensor W, right? So my usual obnoxious notation would be this, right? The matrix of that tensor of those mappings defined in that way is simply the Kronecker product of the matrix of T with respect to the beta basis with the matrix of S with respect to the gamma basis. And that's why we use the same symbol here as we do here as we do. It's all part of the same, same story about taking two vector spaces and multiplying them together to get a new space, the so-called tensor product. Hmm. Now, I guess where this really pays off is it allows you to say some kind of like shocking things. So these identities about linear transformations become statements about product of matrices and their tensor products. So like if we know these things, then it follows that we know the following things like A tensor B. This is a matrix times the matrix C tensor D is equal to A times C tensor B times D. If you think about what this means in terms of that, this is quite awful. It is quite awful and it is and for invertible matrices I've had students work this out before at the level of matrices without all this theory. Like I have had people be successful <coughs> in showing me that A, B inverse is A inverse tensor B inverse, but golly, I'm surprised they could work it out without the benefit of that insight. I, I, don't, I don't know, how, I, I don't think I could get it just at the level of just working with this matrix and trying to show that, goodness gracious. And then finally, last but not least, um, the trace of A tensor B, guess what? It's equal to the trace of A times the trace of B. 
and there's a similar formula for the determinant as well. But something interesting happens with the determinant. Um, so the determinant of the tensor product of A and B ends up being the determinant of A to the nth power times the determinant of B to the mth power, where A is n by n and B is n by n. So, and you have you have other like little little theorems that prove that. Or for example, if if um, if you have a1 similar to a2, and if you have b1 is similar to b2, then you get similarity of the uh, the corresponding tensor product. There's much more to much more to say here. Well, I tried. Anyway, I, I guess I I can't in good conscience put the tensor product on the test, but I will have it in your homework. That's probably going to be it. Yeah. The next mission is due Monday, in fact, that is true. I have this, for those of you who are courageous and want to try the tensor product stuff, I have this handout. Unfortunately, the copying machine has jammed on me. I will send you a scan of this as soon as I can, so I have a limited number. So I would ask that you only take this if you're actually serious about trying the tensor problem problems. This is just a chapter on tensor products from Berbian, which is this book, which is very expensive. It's like. Ten whole dollars. It's a Dover. But what's up? Yeah, you don't have to read this if you don't. I, I think currently in my current statement of mission it says you read read this. I'm freeing you of that. Um, but I will try to ask you some simple questions which are based on filling in the holes in what I did here today mostly. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't, don't. You know, the test will not cover that part. You should try to do the start of the mission, though. Those questions about proving the second and third isomorphism theorems, those are really just like the end of the last homework, which is probably the part you didn't do and need to practice anyway. Just <laughs> guessing it's the end of the homework. So the odds are fairly significant that a significant portion of you haven't really tried the end of the last homework, which is understandable. Anyway, anybody want it? All right. I'll tell you what, I'm going to put them up here, let you get them. Uh, and I will hope